All right, we're in Genesis 47. We'll cover all 31 verses. And uh, we're going to look at jo Joseph and how he manages the, the famine that does come. And it's, it's been going for a while. It's in his second year that he reveals himself to his brother. Uh, they have now come from Egypt. Uh, he has met with them. And now the uh, formal introduction to Pharaoh will take place. Remember uh, last week he was prepping his brothers. When he says this, you say this. When he says this, you respond this way uh, to make sure there's no slip-ups. But uh, he has something in mind. Uh, this is all a kind of a tactical move by Joseph because he realizes that even though he's been able to live in Egypt in this very occultic pagan environment all of these years, he wants to make sure that his family uh, and their tribe can grow into a nation there, which is God's plan, uh, and they can do it with their national identity and their faith intact. Therefore, it's... Uh, all going to be predicated upon the idea that they are shepherds, they are herdsmen, and they then therefore are an abomination to the Egyptians, which as we said last week, actually was a really good thing. So they would not integrate, uh, they would not become Egyptian. You can imagine a group of people living in another country for 400 years and never, never integrating into that culture and in that uh, environment at all. And uh, uh, that would be highly unusual, uh, and it's all going to be predicated on the fact that uh, they are an abomination because of their occupation. So that's going to be a big deal. So he's already told them, when he says, what is your occupation, say this. Of course, that's, that is what they were. All of this orchestrated by, uh, by God's sovereignty. But all of this, again, speaks to us of, of Joseph. We've already seen, uh, you know, he's a tremendous man of faith and integrity, but he's a brilliant guy as well. Uh, he's been running this very powerful nation for a, a number of years. He is like a father to Pharaoh, indicating not only of his trusted abilities, but he's probably a bit older than Pharaoh, even though we've already pegged him to be around uh, 37 or, uh, years old or so. Uh, but uh, so it's very interesting. He's quite quite the diplomat uh, in all of this and trying to get this accomplished. Uh, we'd say Joseph would learn how to choose his words uh, wisely. Proverbs has a lot to say about that and the necessity of that. Proverbs 21, 23 says, he over, he, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Joseph would learn to guard his word. He was also a master of timing. Uh, knew just when to say uh, the right thing. And again, his strategy was very simple. Uh, Pharaoh needed to know that they were shepherds, and he's going to set Pharaoh up by saying, oh, and by the way, they're already in Goshen. That would be a pretty good place for them to be. Remember, on the way down, they had those Egyptian carts. They were on the way down uh, with all the supplies. I'm sure they were at least BMWs uh, made in Egypt, uh, but they're... Uh, they're uh, uh, you know, the, all their directions uh, messed up and the, uh, uh, no one was talking to them in the front of the chariot to tell them which way to go. And so they sent Judah ahead. Uh, Joseph makes contact with him, gives him directions. I can't think of GPS. Uh, their GPS broke. So Judah goes ahead to Joseph. You remember that in the story. Uh, and then uh, they send him on down so they can be located at least temporarily in Goshen because that's where Joseph wants them to be. It's the best part of the land. Well, let's look at this re formal request uh, to live in this particular area. It's in the first six verses. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all their possessions have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. Did I mention that? They're in the land of Goshen. Uh, and he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And, uh, and they said to Pharaoh, quite spontaneously, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land. Because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. In other words, you have your choice. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. 
And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. So again, we'd say the request centers around uh, the desire to live there uh, in Goshen. Uh, and, uh, and again, the last half of verse 1, uh, Joseph kind of makes that uh, clever remark, the fact that they're already there. Uh, then his brothers, as I said, spontaneously chirp in as they were instructed to do so. That uh, when he says, watch your occupation, they said, your servants are shepherds, both we uh, and also our father. So everything's clicking along just the way that it should uh, at that point as they had rehearsed and everything. Of course, the brothers get a little carried away in verse 4. Uh, and they kind of throw in, that's all they were supposed to say, no more, no less. But they jump in verse 4. Oh, and also, we've come to live in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, the famine is severe in Canaan. That's okay. But now they jump in. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And I'm sure Joseph was holding his breath at that point because it's like, don't make the request of Pharaoh. You know, it's got to be his idea. Let it be his idea that you guys uh, live there. It's enough that you're already there. It's enough that your shepherds, you know, trust me on this, but they kind of jump, jump the gun here. Uh, but his strategy, though it was good, it couldn't have gone even better. And the fact that Pharaoh even says, hey, that's no problem. They should live there. Uh, but also he even uh, invites them to become part of his staff. Uh, so notice again, verse five on, it's kind of formalized between Joseph uh, and Pharaoh, this request when he says, your, your father and your brothers have come to you. Uh, the land of Egypt is before them. Uh, have them uh, dwell in the best of the land, of the land of, uh, of Goshen. So again, it's a little bit of the idea. If uh, I don't know if you've ever had one of those bosses before, but if you ever wanted to, to implement one of your ideas, you had to make him think it was his idea. So I, I had one of those before uh, working at Safeway. And uh, anyway, and he was a fun guy to work with, but everything had to be his idea. He was just one of those guys. And uh, so he always had to say, uh, hey, uh, didn't you have an idea to uh, build a special display over here? Did, didn't you mention that a while back? Uh, yeah, you know, I think that's a really excellent idea. I, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, boss, I was thinking that if we did it this way and this way, you know, because that was a very clever thought, the way you figured that out. Yeah, that was a pretty good, and that, and that was my life. I mean, everything had to be his idea. Uh, and, and again, Joseph and Pharaoh don't have a relationship like that. But at the same time, he is the Pharaoh. And he's trying to lead him into what would be the natural uh, uh, suggestion that Goshen is, uh, is the place. And again, why is this such a big deal? Well, we're going to see they're still in a time of great famine. But in this place, it's the Nile Delta. It's a beautiful area. It's uh, leading up towards the Mediterranean. It says several times it's the best of the land. That's not just a euphemism. It really is. And it's going to fit them in terms of, of, um, of their, uh, their, their sheep and their goats and all of their flocks and so forth. And it will remain and keep them isolated away from the rest of the Egyptians. So uh, it's very important they get there. Now, the idea of them uh, being offered jobs was... Uh, 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 not an unusual thing because uh, the Pharaoh himself had these herds, but Egyptians are not shepherds. So it was typical that he would hire foreigners to oversee them. So they end up getting a, an occupation out of it as well. We actually have uh, in, uh, in one document from uh, ancient Egypt under Ramses III, he had employed over 3,000 men to oversee his, uh, his own uh, sheep and cattle and, uh, and so forth. So uh, they end up getting a little extra income out of it as well. Now working for uh, federal um, for the federal government, which of course has a great retirement plan under Pharaoh. So they're they're pretty happy uh, about that. Uh, secondly, Jacob responds to Pharaoh's question about his life, verses uh, seven to twelve. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and sent him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, "How old are you?" And uh, Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. Uh, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out uh, from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. 
Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all of his father's household with bread according to the number in their family. So he first responds to this idea of, uh, of age. And uh, uh, we don't know what Jacob said first, if he said long live the king or something. But uh, obviously, again, the Pharaoh is uh, a lot younger. I mean, he's uh, and Jacob is, uh, you know, 130 uh, at this point. And uh, the one thing that we do note by the uh, conversation here, Jacob probably wasn't particularly impressed. You can imagine. I don't know if you would be impressed uh, to walk into Buckingham Palace for the first time and see the king or the queen or, or something like that. But this is Pharaoh. There would have been an incredibly luxurious, very opulent. Uh, we only get glimpses of, of what it would have been like just from the, the monuments that are uh, still there in uh, Egypt today. Uh, but Jacob uh, was not particularly impressed. This is the guy that had walked with the Lord. He was bearing the promises of God, the covenant promises of God. Uh, and he's very open and he's very honest in this uh, particular uh, exchange. When he talks about his life, he, he frames it by saying it's a pilgrimage. For one thing, I'm just a shepherd. I live in a tent, but it's okay. I'm going somewhere. I'm not there yet. My life here and, uh, and compared to my father and my grandfather has actually been pretty short and my days have been pretty tough. He describes them as evil days. He goes, but, he goes, but the important thing is that I'm on a journey. I'm going somewhere. We're going to see this statement uh, at Jacob uh, in the end. The concern about his bones being taken back to the land because God gave him a promise. God's going to keep the promise. And that's what he's living on uh, at this later stage of his life. Now, a typical Egyptian in Egyptian literature, the ideal old age was, uh, uh, was 110. So Pharaoh could probably hardly uh, conceive uh, of the fact that here's a guy that lives to be uh, 130 years old. But yet says his days are evil because they were. He had undergone the miseries at the hand of Laban there in Mesopotamia, uh, the rape of his daughter, Dina, and Shechem, his beloved Rachel's premature death there near Bethlehem, his eldest son's power-seeking incest uh, when he really tries to take control of the family earlier, uh, again, the brothers and their mass murdering of the Shechemites, uh, and the uh, apparent death of his favorite son uh, at the age uh, of 17. He says, my days <laughs> have really not been that long, even though I'm 130, and they've been evil days. This doesn't sound like a guy that's trying to kind of put on his best, best behavior. You're there at the White House meeting the president, and how has your life been? Uh, just fine, sir. Nice to meet you. I mean, this is, that's not the response he's giving here. Uh, uh, my life, you want to hear about my life? You probably don't. It's been pretty tough. It's been pretty evil. How's your life been? <laughs> that's not the exact... Hi, how are you? That uh, was maybe expecting. But it certainly indicates to us that uh, uh, this crusty old shepherd at 130, you can imagine living outside your whole life for 100, 130 years, uh, pretty rugged guy in this opulence, uh, was not, not impressed. Uh, he responds secondly to the opportunity, though, to bless Pharaoh. And there's actually a, a double blessing here because Pharaoh had already blessed Jacob tremendously. He had uh, promoted, elevated his son, uh, Joseph. Uh, when he finds out that uh, Joseph's family are, are still alive, he sends the provision. He sends those carts and brings them back. Now he promises to give them the best of the land. He uh, gives them employment to some of his men who are the, uh, the better shepherds uh, and so forth. He had really blessed the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. And therefore... Because of the Abrahamic covenant, again there in uh, Genesis 12, 3. I'll bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. They've been blessed, and he's now going to bless him back again. <clears throat> this is also interesting, at least in the ancient world, this idea that... Uh, uh, that the lesser always asks the greater for a blessing. So uh, this is very, uh, very unique, very unusual that Pharaoh sitting on the throne, again, of the most powerful nation on the planet at the time, asked this old shepherd, will you bless me? And of course, he's uh, more than happy to do it. Uh, and certainly in doing it, 
he's remembering and believing and seeing the outworking of God's promises and how they've, they've actually uh, are working out in his life and the life of his family. It's also an interesting study in itself just to watch through history how this promise continues to come, come true as well. Uh, you know, again, you could, whether it's Napoleon or the British Empire or Alexander the Great, uh, as long as world leaders and nations treated the Jewish people fairly and kindly, God blessed them. And when they turned their backs on them, then God removed his hand of blessing because I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. The Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. Uh, and it's eternal, uh, it's still true today. And uh, I appreciate the fact that when we uh, take a, a trip to, to Israel, once in a while you can see a, a little ambulance going by, and it'll have a little thing on the side saying uh, where it came from and who da- donated the money. And very often you'll see one that says, uh, donated by Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And then when you go to the baptismal site there, uh, which uh, used to be, uh, again, 25 years ago, if you took a tour and you want to get baptized on the Jordan River, you would simply, they would pull the bus over by the, the river, <laughs> the river, it's just a river, uh, <clears throat> and then they would um, pull the curtains on the bus and all the guys would get off and all the gals would change and then reverse and the guys would change and you'd make your way over the rocks and down into the uh, the muddy river and uh, and do the baptism and then you know back up to the bus and off you go but today if you go there's a a beautiful place there with about uh, five or six little amphitheaters all built in uh, all along the edge of the Jordan there's uh, uh, beautiful facilities there uh, for you and all all paid for by Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa donated to the tourists uh, ministry of tourism and there's a little poster of Chuck as you first uh, start to go in that's kind of uh, fun to see because the Bible says I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you uh, it was true in Jacob's day it's, uh, it's true today and therefore why we need to be praying for Israel right now and why they need our support uh, more than ever as you watch the news there's been a lot going on in the last uh, uh, just in the last four or five days Iran's got enough um, uh, 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 uranium enriched to uh, build about six bombs now. They're not, uh, uh, they're not ready to go, but they're, they are going to be very quickly. There's going to be, uh, uh, again, monumental decision uh, by Netanyahu. There was uh, his basically equivalent of Homeland Security guy who is out there prepping all of their uh, bomb shelters uh, over the last couple of three weeks and making sure everybody's gas mask works and everything. They're preparing for for war, and his assessment is that when they attack the nuclear facilities uh, in uh, in Iran, that uh, uh, best case scenario they could push their program back a couple of years. Uh, they don't have the capabilities alone without our help to actually destroy it. Uh, and there will be a counterattack because you have Hezbollah that has about about 60 to 70 thousand missiles now uh, in the north. And you've got Hamas that's got quite a few uh, right next door to them. So they'll know uh, there'll be a tremendous retaliation and they expect the war to go at least 30 days and to lose at least 500 lives in terms of civilians and so forth. So this is a, uh, a very difficult decision and uh, we need to keep praying. And hopefully, hopefully we pray that uh, our government will uh, stand with Israel, whatever they need to do to defend themselves. But uh, the double blessing. Uh, Pharaoh has truly blessed the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, and he is blessed in return, and that continues to be the case uh, even today. Well, Joseph will continue to respond to the needs of his family. You see that in verse 11, and, uh, uh, which brings up a, a couple of issues. Uh, notice he situates them there. Uh, they are in the best of the land. Uh, and he's able to provide uh, for them. So even though there's a tremendous famine, I mean, and starvation, uh, we don't have to use our imagination because we've seen famines on the news uh, in other places in Africa, and that's what's going on in that part of the world. All through North Africa, they're all dependent upon the Nile flooding uh, to produce their crops all the way up into Canaan. People are starving. They're desperate. There's several years, not one year of a famine. We, we see what that produces in our world today. This is back to back to back for, for seven years. People are getting very desperate. And in the midst of it, though, 
God's people have been provided for, uh, and, uh, and they're going to be able to uh, stay under Joseph's care uh, for a, a long period of time. Uh, the third thing, or fourth thing here, is we need to respond to the problem that's in verse 11. And I know many of you thought, I don't really see a problem in verse 11. But it's with the mention of Ramses there, the best of the land in the land uh, of Ramses. <clears throat> the reason it's a problem is this, and I'll try not to belabor it because we spent a little bit of time. I mentioned it in our uh, Mother's Day messages. Yes, there's not too many places you could go for a Mother's Day message uh, and learn about the pharaohs of Egypt. But we did because we were focusing on uh, the mother of Moses. And uh, we talked about his uh, coming to power and so forth. But the idea of, uh, is that Ramses becomes a very, Ramses II becomes a very famous pharaoh of Egypt. He comes on the scene at about 319 BC. So 319 over here. Uh, the exodus occurs in 1446. Uh, and we know that they were there in Egypt 430 years. Therefore, uh, Joseph in the time of our writing is about 1876. So you have about a 500 year gap. In other words, you've got a mention in 1876 of a pharaoh that doesn't come along for another 500 years. So how do you reconcile that? You understand the problem? So that's why if you watch uh, you know, uh, A&E or History Channel or one of those, and you see something about uh, the pharaohs and so forth, if they make a reference to the Exodus, they push the date around the you know, uh, 1200s or whatever uh, <clears throat> BC. Uh, and they, they, so they, they move it you know, hundreds of years away from where, where it should be. Uh, no, so a couple things about this. Uh, how do we know that it did occur when it did in terms of 1446? We have several references uh, in the Bible to it. Uh, when, for example, when Solomon's temple is dedicated, dedicated that, that, this many years after the Exodus. So you, you have references like that. And if you run them all back, they all come to 1446. Uh, and you've even got one uh, outside source of a meeting with uh, uh, a ruler in uh, Israel named Jehu or Yehu with a man named Sal Salzamar happens to occur on an eclipse outside uh, um, data gives us the exact day of the eclipse. If, even if you take that and run it all back, you still get to 1446. And when you look at that date as we did and even later the time of Moses, it's uh, everything fits perfectly in terms of what was going on. Was there a foreign um, uh, pharaoh at the time of Joseph that would have accepted him if that was the date? Yes, there was. They were being ruled by the Hiskos people at that time, not Egyptians. Uh, at the time that Moses comes on the scene, was there a woman who was powerful enough, a princess of the pharaoh, who could have saved him and who could, could have made him pharaoh? Yes, there was. And we actually showed you pictures of her, of her and her <coughs> mummified tomb and, uh, and the uh, monuments built to her and, uh, and talked a bit about her. Everything fits perfectly. And of course, there's, by secular sources, they want to move the exodus so they can discredit the timeline uh, of the Bible and discredit the Bible itself. And you can understand why there would be a few Egyptians <laughs> that would want to discredit the Bible. Because a, a couple of them are Muslim. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, so you kind of have this clash of the dates. Uh, let me give you a couple of explanations uh, of, in terms of how in verse 11 you have a mention of Ramses and there's another place where he's mentioned as well. Uh, one, uh, a simple explanation would be that the name of land uh, places change over time. And it could have been later that this land becomes known as uh, Ramses. That's one explanation. The other explanation is that uh, Ramses was a name that was not uncommon. Again, it's, it's a derivative of the sun god Ra, Ra, Ra Ramses. Uh, and do we find that in Egyptian history? Yes, we have a, paint, uh, uh, a tomb painting where uh, a lesser official named Ramses is mentioned long before the pharaoh Ramsey ever comes on the scene. Uh, I think the, the best explanation is just the fact that uh, the text here emphasizes several times that it's the land of Ramses. It's the best land. It's the most fruitful land uh, in all of Egypt. So in 319, you get a guy coming to the throne, and he says, I want my name to be known as Ramses. 
because I will make all of Egypt as fruitful as the best land. Again, do we have a case for that? Uh, yeah, we certainly do. The princess that raised, remember, that raised Moses, his name was Tut or Tut Moses the first because he said he was, he was taken from the Nile. And so therefore, he takes the name that indicates he is drawn from the Nile, the, the Nile uh, again, which was one of their gods, Tut Moses. So uh, and that's, of course, where Moses gets, uh, gets his name. Anyway, I think it's important to kind of look at the problems uh, that are there in the Bible and at least give you a couple of explanations the next time you see something on the History Channel or whatever. I like, love to watch all those, and, uh, and, uh, and I, uh, anytime we get a chance and we're in a city somewhere, if there's an ancient history or natural history museum, you know, we, we go and we check it all out and stuff. And it is interesting to see what they get right, of course, what they get, uh, we would say, get wrong, uh, because we'd certainly put our, our faith and trust in the scriptures. And when there seems to be a contradiction, uh, there's always an explanation for it. And when there's no explanation, then it's just, wait, give those guys a chance. Let them keep digging in the, in the Middle East, and eventually they're going to uncover, uh, again, an outside source of information that uh, actually confirms what the Bible says. Uh, and that's one of the fun things about going over there, is seeing that evidence firsthand, because that has uh, occurred on many, many occasions. Well, let's go on to Joseph and his uh, management of the resources of Egypt during this, again, very severe time uh, of a famine. Verse 13. Now there was no bread in all the land, and for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished uh, because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence, for the money has failed. And Joseph said, uh, Give your livestock, stock, and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all the, their livestock, that year. So you've got preceding years. Uh, when that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, uh, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of our livestock. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priest he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. And they ate their rations, which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your land in this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is a seed for you, uh, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own, and seed for the field and for your food, for those of your household, uh, and as food for your little ones. So they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priest only, which did not come before, uh, which did not become Pharaoh. So uh, a lot going on here, but we have the successive years of famine. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. So he manages the resources uh, and it's difficult because of the severity. And, uh, and again, you can see what's uh, happening here. Uh, they, uh, they come in first and uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they sell, uh, they buy all they can uh, with their money. 
and, uh, and, then, and then comes uh, all of the livestock they have, uh, and eventually uh, their land uh, itself. So again, Joseph had provided for the people. He had created these great storehouses of, of grain. He had uh, uh, decentralized them and placed them throughout the country uh, for this particular occasion. Uh, and it's interesting the way that they speak to Joseph. Very respectful, very thankful. Hey, you saved our lives and so forth. So uh, he's able to manage the resources on behalf of, uh, of Pharaoh, certainly. Pharaoh's coming out pretty good. He's doing pretty good for his boss, isn't he? Would you like to have Joseph working for you? He's doing okay uh, for him. But he also is taking care of his own people. Uh, notice his family is, is well taken care of. They are multiplying. They are prosperous in a time of severe famine. And again, it's year after year after year. They might be five, six years into the famine that's going to go for seven years. Uh, and yet here are the, uh, the, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, and Jacob, the Jewish people. They're in Goshen. They're in the best in the land. Uh, they're still getting some water because they're, uh, the location that they're at, uh, they're still green pasture land. Uh, and they are doing quite well. Uh, God is able to watch over, and he's prospering uh, his people during uh, this time. Uh, but then Joseph manages the resources, certainly for the benefit of Pharaoh. Now, this is interesting. All the people eventually become uh, tenant farmers. Uh, Joseph is very criticized, by the way, by some uh, because of what he's doing here. What he's doing, he ends up taking all the property, all the livestock, and all the people, people become slaves. And he moves them all into the cities. He's just such a terrible guy. Actually, he's not according to them. In fact, there was a Rasmussen poll uh, done in the fifth year of the famine, and Joseph had an, uh, an over an 80% approval rating, 10% disapproval, 10% undecided. But uh, just kidding, uh, according to the New York Times. But uh, uh, he, the people loved Joseph because, again, the images of what a famine would be like, those images we see on the screen, that's what it's going to be like except Joseph is, uh, is saving them. And they don't have a problem with giving him everything if they can just simply uh, survive. So he's able to orchestrate and manage this thing for the benefit of his own family, his physical descendants out there in Goshen. For Pharaoh, who's got to be pretty stoked here uh, with what, uh, what's going on, he's become incredibly wealthy at this point. And basically, the whole farming system has become uh, nationalized, uh, and now all the people will be tenant farmers. But notice he puts them under a flat tax. <clears throat> he basically says, I'll, I'll give you what you need. And you get to keep 80%. You give uh, 20% to Pharaoh. And that's uh, quite okay with, uh, with all of them. <clears throat> the other thing that's here is the priests are exempt. They're getting a, a, a ration uh, from Pharaoh, so they're okay. They don't have to sell. All of this is kind of setting up the future. Uh, God's people are over here, and they're prospering because they've got a lot of wealth and everything, right? Uh, but what is happening is God now is going to prosper them in the future as slaves. I don't think that's too prosperous. But from God's perspective, apparently it is. Uh, God is, is going to build them into a nation, and he's going to take care of them until Joseph goes off the scene. Of course, we have another Pharaoh that rises, knows not Joseph, because he's a guy who's actually Egyptian, that arises up from the south, who's very much afraid of the Jewish people because they're so prosperous. So he puts them all into bondage. And that's all part of God's plan. It's all part of God's plan. That they would suffer enough in the incubation of, <clears throat> of difficulty and hard times that they would finally look to him and believe a guy like Moses when he comes on the scene. And even then there was a big struggle. They were ready to kill Moses after a while because life got difficult before it was going to get better. But it's also God could keep his word and he could take the nation that he had built through the good and through the bad and now take them into the land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think we all like, like the prosper part where <clears throat> incomes are going up and rents are going down and uh, the car is getting nicer and all of that. We love that kind of prospering, but uh, God also prospers us as people, as individual, even in the most difficult times. That's what the New Testament tells us, right? Peter says, don't be surprised when you fall into fiery trials. That doesn't sound like a good trial, does it? <clears throat> fiery trial. And then, of course, the James 1, uh, 2 to 4, you know. 
Uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So apparently the prosperity of stuff alone really doesn't really help us. It's also the prosperity of difficulty and trials uh, that sometimes we need the most. And God's going to do both for his people. So how does he do it? He brings this famine to bring the people down there to start with. They would have never come if Joseph wasn't the guy in charge. This would have never worked out. But they all came. They were all in. They brought everything they had. We saw that last week. And now he orchestrates it so that Joseph is able to buy up everything in the whole country. They're okay now because the guy that's on the throne, basically, Joseph is like a father to him. Joseph is calling the shots, uh, but he's... He's a good guy. Basically, uh, he, he, is, he is over everything, but he cares about the people and so forth. And as long as you've got that, it's okay to have this, uh, uh, this uh, ruler over you with uh, complete power, as long as he's benevolent. And Joseph was benevolent. But of course, succeeding the pharaohs are going to come along. The guys are going to come along. They're not so nice. They're a little more selfish about things. And life is going to get more difficult for uh, everybody. But all of that was necessary. That was all being orchestrated uh, so that God's plan for his people could be worked out. And even this idea of exempting the priesthood, because we even know from uh, Egyptian history that because of that, they grow powerful. And they were, they were pretty powerful on the scene by the time Moses confronts them. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see that if we, uh, if we were to consider uh, continue our study through Exodus. Well, uh, let's look lastly at Joseph's management of the resources to be fair to everyone. As we said, they're pretty uh, excited about things. Just one little quote from uh, one Jewish writer I've read from a few times. He says that Joseph's actions cannot be measured by the moral standards of the Hebrew Bible. Rather, they must be judged in the context of the ancient Near Eastern world, by whose norms Joseph emerges here as a highly admirable model of a shrewd and successful administrator. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a moral judgment on the situation is subtly introduced into the narrative by shifting the onus of responsibility for the fate of the peasants from Joseph to the Egyptians themselves. The peasants initiate uh, the idea of their own enslavement and even express gratitude when it's uh, implemented. So they're pretty happy about the, the whole thing. And, uh, and again, it, it all works as long as you have a benevolent dictator the problem is when Joseph goes off the scene. Uh, the fourth thing here is Jacob's concern about his final return uh, to the land where he will be buried. Verse 27. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt and in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Again, everybody else is, is suffering through. But Israel, the nation of Israel, is growing exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of his bed. So uh, his desire is uh, to uh, return uh, and uh, despite the uh, prosperity. So they're being blessed uh, tremendously. We see that in verse 27. Uh, and things are going well. Uh, but Jacob says, I don't care how well things are going here. I don't care the fact that uh, now I've got great, great, great grandkids and, uh, and uh, things are multiplying. I don't care how many herds and, and sheep and cattle and how things are going. When I die, you swear to me that you'll take my bones out of here and you'll take me back to the cave at Machpelah where Abraham and Sarah, where Isaac and Rachel, and where my wife, remember it's not Rachel, it's Leah, uh, excuse me, Leah that's, uh, that's there, where he'll be buried by her side as well. And the whole point of this, it's a statement of his own faith. God said he will give us the land. 
uh, the promised land. And this isn't it. Doesn't matter how much we're prospering here. Doesn't matter the fact that I'm just living in a tent and I'm a pilgrim. I'm going somewhere. And it doesn't matter if I don't even see the promise myself. I still want to go there. I don't know if you really thought about this. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 makes a big deal out of this. That they believed the promises even though they never saw them. Jacob believes that God will give them Canaan. And it will become, of course, we will refer to it as the land of Israel, or Eretz Israel, named after uh, Jacob uh, himself. Uh, even though he never saw it, he believed it. I don't know how you would deal with somebody promising to give you a house one day. And then on your deathbed, <laughs> they still never gave you the house. But you're like, yeah, but I'm getting it, man. I believe it, because they said it. They're going to... You know, God's going to give them the land. I may not see it. I may be down here in Egypt, but I absolutely believe God's going to give us that land. So when it happens, you take me and you bury me there because that's where I want to be. Uh, again, he realizes that he physically wouldn't be there, that he would be, uh, you know, with the Lord in the presence of the Lord. But all of this is a statement of faith. And of course, it impacts Joseph as well. And we saw that last week because Joseph says the same thing. He tells his brothers and tells others around him and his sons, when you leave, when there is an exodus, when God takes you into the land, you take my bones out of this place. I don't care how long it is. Of course, it was 400 years later. But when that, that uh, cloud uh, of God's presence led Moses and that million and plus people left, uh, Joseph's bones uh, left uh, with him. But it's uh, an interesting uh, 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 situation. One writer said the time in Egypt is not an interruption of the covenant. It's an incubation of the covenant people because God was working uh, in their lives. Uh, and then Jacob is concerned about returning again for the, the burial itself. And uh, he knew that God was able to orchestrate everything and pull this all off. Isaiah the prophet says, uh, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all things. God is the one that was doing all of this. God compelled them to get down there. Uh, God brought about uh, uh, the severity of the famine. God orchestrated it so that basically Egypt farming system, which was, was uh, huge, would become nationalized so that the succeeding pharaohs would have tremendous power. He made it so that the priests would uh, themselves be excluded from that so they would grow powerful as well. He set it all up so this incubation period for his people there would be in a time of prosperity, but then they would be able to prosper even as slaves, even under the most difficult circumstances. And of course, part of that forcing them to, uh, to leave. Uh, keep in mind that even when they crossed the Red Sea, when they hit some hard times, a lot of them were going, can't we just go back to Egypt? I mean, if it hadn't gotten bad, they would have just never moved on. Uh, and sometimes God does that in our lives as well. Sometimes he allows it to get kind of bad so that we really need him, so that we're really willing to move on and, uh, and have uh, his guidance before us and being able to choose what he chooses uh, for us. Uh, notice that he's so concerned, Jacob, he has that Joseph swear to him twice, once again in verse 31, swear to me, so he, he swore to him. One of the things that we missed here in Jacob's life that when it says, and he bowed, that's the term for worship. And there wasn't on the head of his bed, it was holding on to his staff. It's kind of not a, uh, it's, it's not the best translation right there. <laughs> I don't know if you think, well, what kind of a headboard did he have there in that tent? You know, uh, the, the head of his bed, he probably slept on the ground, you know, and, uh, uh, but uh, he's, he's hanging on to his staff, but he is bowing and he's praising God because even if it's just his bones, he's going to make it back into the land because he could trust Joseph. And Joseph swore twice that he would, he would do it. Now, the other thing is that uh, between those two passages, we've got a 17-year elapse. In other words, they get settled in the land, and then Joseph uh, and, uh, and Jacob have this conversation, and it's 17 years later. He's now 147, which indicates that those years were very uh, good years, tranquil, tranquil years. Uh, Jacob had 17 years with Joseph at the beginning of his life, uh, and he's got 17 years with him uh, at, uh, at the end of his life. Uh, very, uh, very interesting. So those are all good years. The next couple of chapters, of course, close. The focus is back on Jacob. 
and what he has to say about his son's uh, promises and prophetic messages to them and what their futures would be like. Uh, but in all of this, just to see God's sovereignty and God orchestrating all of these events. And we've already mentioned the fact that to be a Joseph, to be like Joseph, to be able to go through what he went through uh, and to be used to bring this tremendous reconciliation to his family. Again, he's reconciled to them, but more importantly, they are reconciled to God. It's because he had, we, we said it was 50-20 vision. Again, chapter 50, verse 20 says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good in the saving of many lives. So we said 20-20 vision. If you're blessed enough to have it, uh, it means you can see things in your present circumstances clearly. The 50-20 means you can see something beyond that in terms of a heavenly perspective. There's two other passages of scripture that certainly go along with that. These three together are so important. That they just kind of hang together. The one we can almost guess. What would be the New Testament equivalent of this idea of, uh, of, of Genesis 50-20? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. I don't want to do a little survey, but I'm hoping uh, that most of you would say Romans 8.28. Uh, it's pretty much the same idea. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Uh, but put with that the promise of Jeremiah 29.11, where Jeremiah says, I, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future uh, and a hope. And if you can somehow hang on to those three, or at least remember that idea of the 50-20 vision, the next time you're rear-ended on the freeway, or uh, oh, like Eddie, the next time your house floods <laughs> because of a broken pipe. Uh, you know, it's tough. It's, it's tough. You know, it's one thing to stump your toe. Oh, well, praise the Lord, you know, I'll get over it. But it's another thing when, when very difficult things happen to us. Uh, but Joseph is, well, he had a, some pretty tough stuff. Sold into slavery, becomes a slave, falsely accused of a sexual crime, thrown into a dungeon. This kid hung in there, and uh, it didn't matter what the world threw at him. Uh, he still trusted God uh, because he had that 50-20 vision. And certainly Jacob's got it as well. Jacob's got it as well. And, and in this plea to say, please take me when I die and make sure I'm buried back in the land because I believe God will keep his promises. Uh, it's a great way for him to end his life. He's got a few more things to say before that happens. Uh, but we leave him in this passage leaning on his staff at 147 and bowing and worshiping the Lord. Well, let's pray. Whoa.